I'll give you my coat after I get off the stage. Okay. Uh, in the interests of being prompt, we will get started. I know there's still people out signing, but I think we'll pull all of the sheets in and then we'll put them back out when we're done. Um, so let me welcome you to our third David S. Sauerman provocative lecture for the fall of 2014. Um, thank you all for taking the time to uh, join us this evening. My name is Jack Estel and I'm a lecturer with the Department of Economics, as many of you know. Uh, before I go further, I, I put this in my notes because I always forget to do this myself. I turn off my phone and I would appreciate it if everyone else joined me. Oh, that would be nice. Um, and uh, additionally, after this lecture, we will have our usual meeting of the Barstool Economists uh, at Flames Eatery on the corner of 4th and San Fernando. Uh, the Barstool is a group of individuals from across the country now who share economic ideas on the web. Um, fortunately, many of the members live here in the Bay Area, so it is open to anyone who would like to join. It's on Yahoo Groups, and if you are interested in joining and can't find it any other way, if you contact me, I would be happy to help you navigate your way there. Uh, everyone, member or potential member, and we think everyone here is a potential member, is welcome to join us and continue the discussion after the lecture at Flames. Um, and you can talk about rapid transit options or other items of economics that you find of interest. Um, I will be posting the spring 2015 schedule for the provocative lectures of the department uh, on our website as soon as we have them firmed up. Uh, I can promise you another interesting and engaging collection of speakers. We hope that you will join us to uh, hear and discuss their thoughts. Uh, I hope that the, I will have that up within the next probably 30 days. Uh, this lecture series started 13 years ago to foster our vision of higher education, uh, challenging ideas and developing critical thinking uh, in an environment of respectful intellectual discourse. Please relax and listen to Professor Holian tonight as he discusses his research in rail transit in San, in San Jose. He will provide a question and answer period at the end of the presentation to allow the audience to uh, explore any specifics that they're interested in. It's our hope that this lecture will encourage a great understanding of the benefits, a greater understanding, sorry, of the benefits and costs of various tra uh, um, train options or uh, rail options, I should say as well as an appreciation for the pursuit of knowledge in general and the effort that researchers put into their work um, trying to find new ways to take data and understand the world that we live in in a, in a different and maybe better way. Um, Matt Holian, as many of you know, is an assistant professor in economics in the economics department here at San Jose State uh, University. He came to us seven years ago after completing his PhD at The Ohio State University. Okay. Thank you. Uh, since arriving, he has not only inspired his students, but he's also published new, numerous articles in refereed journals, including Public Choice. Uh, in fact, he's been so prolific that he was honored last night by San Jose State University as one of the only two professors at uh, SJSU to receive the 2004-14 Early Career Investigator Awards. So congratulations <laughs> are in order. It, it's part of the work that gets done here that I think we often forget about the research that goes on here and how many people are involved in research. Not only that, how many students are inspired to do research because they get to interact with people who are actively doing that right now. And Matt is one of those people. Um, he has accumulated an impressive list of grants and has still found time to uh, run our Friday colloquium along with Professor Reagan and Haight. Uh, which encourages students to pursue their own research. On top of that, he's become the assessment guru for the department, creating innovative ways to measure our performance and help us improve our success rate. And uh, that is often a thankless job, but one that he does very well. Um, how does he have time to teach? That's a good question. I haven't figured out the answer to that, but I can assure you that he does. As his students will, it, will attest, he uh, does it exceptionally well. So. Please welcome Professor Holian as he shares his latest research in cost-benefit analysis of our local rail options. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. You're welcome. 
welcome. Well, those are some very kind words, Jack. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to you today about a topic that I'm very interested in and many of you have also thought a lot about. Many of you ride uh, transit and um, if not, you may have been following the debates uh, about BART coming into San Jose and high-speed rail connecting San Francisco to Los Angeles. And so the plan for tonight is to provide some background on these, uh, these infrastructure projects and then to assess these investments in terms of cost-benefit analysis. And cost-benefit analysis is a tool that economists use to look at investments. And it differs from some of the financial analysis that maybe you learn in, in business college uh, courses or some of your other courses. And I'll talk about exactly what cost-benefit analysis is um, as we get into the talk. But to begin, I'd like to motivate the talk a bit by uh, asking the question, why is transportation important? On the screen you see a figure of uh, average income in England from 1200 to 2000. And this is a uh, figure that illustrates how high incomes are a very recent phenomena in, uh, in the history of human existence. For the first uh, 800, um, well, 600 years on this figure, what you see is average income was pretty much flat at about $100. Uh, uh, but right around 1800, something happened, something very dramatic, and that is average income and quality of life took off. And why was this? Well, there are many theories for what caused the Industrial Revolution, but I think all economists would agree that uh, innovations in transportation were key. They linked together uh, areas that formerly uh, were too far, and economic uh, activities were able to take place between these areas, trade and specialization advanced. And so perhaps it's not an overstatement to say that transportation innovations have had a very large role in helping us enjoy the quality of life that we enjoy today. So the 19th century, you might say, was the century of the railroads. Um, automobiles were invented uh, almost 100 years later. In this talk tonight, I'm going to show you a number of pictures from San Jose. And uh, of course, the, the transit projects that we'll discuss all come through Tran San Jose. And so um, it's a bit of a case study, but also a little bit of history. And you'll see how San Jose is, has uh, shaped or been shaped by transportation over the years. This picture shows First Street and Santa Clara. By the way, the light rail line that currently runs down First Street follows this exact same path. And in this figure, you see the old streetcar system that used to run in San Jose, as well as uh, an early automobile and horse and buggy. Well, this picture is from a couple decades later, and the automobile technology improved. The streetcar technology also improved. And the question at the top of this screen is both a literal question about this picture, but also uh, a, a more broader question about which transportation mode would come to dominate in San Jose and the surrounding area. And you all know the answer to that question. Uh, flash forward a few more decades, and we have the construction of uh, I-280, and also uh, the streetcar line was eliminated. They did have a um, bus system remaining, but uh, no more streetcars. So these transportation decisions have a dramatic effect on the way that our cities look. Uh, before automobiles, it was not possible for many people to have single-family homes on private lots uh, because the commute was simply too far, but the automobile uh, enabled that. And of course, the automobile enabled many uh, wonderful things for us to get around quickly and to uh, enjoy uh, uh, speed and convenience. But it also changed the shape of our cities. And this table shows you the fraction of the population living at various distances from downtown in metropolitan areas in the United States. And by downtown, we're, we're uh, measuring that as the location, the, the center of the city uh, that is the largest city in the metropolitan area. So for example, in the top left portion of this table, you see that in 1970, 31.6% of people lived within five miles from downtown. But that figure fell in 2010, you see in the bottom left portion of the screen, uh, to about 17%. 
At the same time, the fraction of the population living far from downtown uh, rose dramatically. So for example, in 1970, and this is in the top right-hand corner of the screen, 5% of the population lived more than 35 miles from downtown. But this figure uh, almost quadrupled, um, well, more than quadrupled to 23.5% uh, uh, in 2010. So our uh, cities have become more suburban, and that was facilitated by the automobile. So what is the background of the light rail system that we have today in San Jose? Well, right around the time that I-280 was under construction, uh, Santa Clara County formed a transit agency that consolidated the three main bus lines that were left after the streetcar uh, ended. And this later became VTA. In 1976, an important sales tax was passed, and Santa Clara voters have, over the years, um, in, in 2000 and uh, in other elections, uh, also approved similar sales taxes to fund transit. Pretty much from the beginning, the VTA, as it became known, uh, started planning for transit, and in the early 1980s, they began to build it. This image shows you how the light rail system has developed over the years. Starting in 1987 with one uh, short link, it expanded uh, until 2005, we have the system um, that we have today. And the original system, the original plan called for uh, a larger system, which would have a ring around uh, San Jose and, and more uh, spokes coming out of it. Obviously, that hasn't materialized. And I'll talk about the extent to which we might expect more um, uh, uh, route extensions. But the short answer is, uh, to cut to the chase, we can't expect too many more in the foreseeable future. I took this figure from the San Jose Mercury News, and you might be able to see the top right-hand portion of that. It says, the system lags on average nationally. And that is a characteristic of the system that, well, many people, I would say, have that impression, both people who are uh, involved in researching transit or maybe just using it. And this figure shows why it is. Um, the red bars show you how many miles of track the system has, and it's larger, in fact, than most of the comparable systems, um, such as Salt Lake City and Sacramento. Yet the uh, blue bars indicate that its ridership is the, among the lowest. And so um, these are the uh, data from 2010. Uh, this slide shows in addition to some revenue statistics, also cost statistics. And there's a lot of cities here. Let me see if I can point out where San Jose is. San Jose is here. And so um, it, the, the y-axis is the, you probably can't read that, the fare, bu fare box recovery ratio. It's the fraction of operating costs um, recovered in terms of revenue. And San Jose is pretty much the lowest in the country in terms of uh, uh, revenue over operating costs. However, uh, in terms of operating costs, uh, which are on the x-axis, you see it's actually somewhere in the middle. So the way to characterize uh, the VTA light rail system is that they have low ridership, um, but the costs are not high necessarily compared to other systems. They're not the lowest, but they're not the highest either. And the VTA uh, has plans for modifying the system somewhat over the years ahead. Uh, one of the uh, aspects of the new system is there will be fewer stations. So for example, the Evelyn station and Mountain View will be eliminated. But the um, also some express trains will be added. But one of the big changes you see here is that BART is uh, on the right-hand portion of, this, uh, of the slide, uh, BART will come into San Jose, projected around 2017, 2018. Um, the, uh, the stop that will connect with light rail is in, Mil is in uh, Milpitas, and then the last stop will be in San Jose uh, near Berryessa. And that brings us to BART. Uh, some of you know the history of BART and how San Jose w wound up not being included in the original uh, BART district. Um, but for those of you who don't, uh, a little background is that in the 
the planning for BART basically began at the end of World War II. And in the 1950s, the early 1950s, all Bay Area counties were uh, involved in planning the system. But Santa Clara County supervisors opted out. And so, uh, and, and, and later, uh, San Mateo County supervisors opted out. And so they were not part of the original system. But a couple of decades later, they began, uh, VTA and others in the uh, Silicon Valley began planning for the Fremont South Bay Corridor that is under construction now. As I mentioned, in 2000, voters approved another sales tax. And so we expect to see the, uh, the line to Berryessa by 2018. When will we see the line to downtown San Jose? Um, that is not a, a date that I found anywhere on the VTA website. I think that the, uh, the funding is a bit uncertain. They didn't uh, bring in as much revenue uh, or, or tax revenue or, or, or fare box revenue as they thought. So uh, my guess is it, 2025 would be a, a, a probably or later. Okay, well, with that background in mind, I'd like to get into the, uh, the heart of the talk, which is the cost-benefit analysis. And the cost-benefit analysis that we'll talk about tonight is what I'll call a simple cost-benefit analysis. Ideally, cost-benefit analysis takes into account all impacts, uh, all benefits and all costs. Um, but that's hard to do. It's also, even when it is done, it's hard to follow. And so my goal for tonight is to show you all the assumptions that go into the numbers that I'm going to present. And you can decide for yourself whether you think those assumptions were reasonable. Um, and if not, uh, y you can uh, imagine how modifying those assumptions would change the outcome. Um, I'll, I'll do a, a, the simple cost benefit analysis for the existing VTA light rail and BART systems. That means I'm not really going to be looking at the BART extension as a separate project. Rather, I'll just look at the whole BART system and, of course, the BART extension may be more or less efficient than the whole system on average, uh, but at least it gives us some indication of whether BART is efficient. And then finally, uh, I'll look at the high-speed rail system, which, of course, hasn't been built yet and has hardly even started to begin construction. Um, and this is a future project. Well, even though the, the numbers I'll present to you are simple cost-benefit analysis, it is worthwhile to consider those other factors that I'm not going to quantify tonight, um, and we'll talk about those in more qualita qualitatively at the end of the talk. When people hear the term cost-benefit analysis, they often think they know exactly what we're talking about. But in fact, economists mean something uh, rather unique by it. In particular, it means social cost-benefit analysis, which means we take into account benefits and costs uh, to anyone in society. So for example, if a light rail system uh, leads to drivers leaving the road and taking the train, then the roads will be less congested. That will lead to benefits for the drivers who remain on the road, right? They'll get to where they're going faster. There will also be fewer accidents. And cost-benefit analysis monetizes all impacts. So if there are fewer accidents, there are fewer deaths. And right now, the going rate for a human life is about $4 million. And uh, we're not going to talk about where that number comes from, but the point is, there, are, there is a benefit in terms of increased safety and uh, cost-benefit analysis monetizes those. But we're going to ignore all those external benefits and focus only on the benefits to the riders of the system. You might be curious who uses cost-benefit analysis. And my answer would be uh, some government agencies, not, unfortunately not enough government agencies. I think we would get better policies if more government agencies did use it. But it has been mandated by the federal government uh, by uh, 1981 by President Reagan to use for any major regulatory change. And subsequent presidents uh, have affirmed that uh, commitment to cost-benefit analysis. Some states use cost-benefit analysis. Um, again, not as many probably as should. And in California, uh, the one agency that I'm most familiar with, the Department of Transportation, also uses cost-benefit analysis. And I'll talk a bit about uh, the model that Caltrans, the Department of Transportation in California, uses. This figure shows that um, uh, Washington and a few other states are rather active in using cost-benefit analysis for policy making, uh, but the other 40 states um, either don't make much use of it or make very, very little use of it. 
had the opportunity to work on a research project with the Mineta Transportation Institute over the last year. And through that project, I went to Sacramento and interviewed some of the an, uh, analysts at Caltrans and asked them about the, the models that they use. And some of you might be interested to see an example of this type of model. I know you can't see most of the uh, screen here, but this is an Excel spreadsheet program. And Caltrans runs this model maybe 100 or 200 times a year for many types of projects, mostly uh, lane addition projects. So when they add a lane, uh, they want to assess whether that's uh, what are the benefits of that? And so they'll enter in traffic estimates here with and without the project. They'll enter in the number of lanes currently on the road and the number of lanes with the project. That model will calculate speeds, accidents, pollution, and so on with and without the project. And then the output will be shown in a uh, figure or table rather like this. And so the main reason I'm showing you this, in addition to give you some sense of how cost-benefit analysis is actually used in the real world, is also to show you those types of external benefits that I'm going to ignore in my simple cost-benefit analysis, but that a more comprehensive uh, cost-benefit analysis would include. And so on the right-hand side, you see that travel time savings is quantified. Um, and this is a, a benefit to the user, the type that I will include, um, as well as vehicle operating costs. But there also are accident cost savings. And these are measured in terms of dollars, right? Some of these accidents would have led to deaths, and some of, some of them would have led to injuries. All of those are monetized. Uh, in addition, emission cost savings are, um, are also monetized. And why are emissions, uh, why is reducing emissions beneficial? Well, emissions uh, cause various health pro public health uh, problems. And more and more, California policymakers are taking into account the impact of vehicular emissions on climate change. And trans the transportation industry accounts for about 30% of the nation's uh, CO2 emissions. Well, I've already said the information that's on this slide a couple of times, but I think it's, it's worth emphasizing, so I might even mention some of, them, uh, some of these things once or twice again, just to keep in mind that this is simple cost-benefit analysis, and there are external benefits that are not included, but we will return to those. Let me give you an example, and I, the, if you will bear with me for a couple minutes, the technical part of the talk will be over, and we'll get back into some more pictures and fun things soon enough, I promise. But to make sure that people understand what precisely we mean by cost-benefit analysis, I think this simple example will help. Imagine there is a system on which one million uh, trips are taken a, uh, a day, say, or a year. Time period doesn't, uh, let's make it a, a year for it to be concrete. Each of them pays a dollar, but operating costs are also a dollar. So from these first three pieces of information, you should realize that this is not a profitable system, right? There are zero profits in this system. In addition, the fourth bullet point, uh, we learned that the capital costs are $10 million. So in addition to this not being a profitable system, it's actually a loss-making system, right? It's a, it's a profit of negative $10 million from this system. However, this is not necessarily the conclusion of a cost-benefit analysis. Why? Because we measure the value to all users. Um, well, sorry, let me back up. This is simple cost-benefit analysis, but we take into account the full value to the users. And so if there are some users who are willing to pay more than a dollar, say a user, some users are willing to pay $10, then they're going to receive a benefit that's greater than that reflected by the simple $1 fare that they pay. One of the keys to any cost-benefit analysis is estimating demand. And so how can we use the information that I just shared with you to estimate demand? Well, we know that right now the fare is $1 and there are one million trips taken. And so that is the point shown by the star on the bottom right. But I also told you that some users are willing to pay up to $10, and that's the star on the top left. So one thing we could do is simply connect those dots and say, this is our estimated demand curve. Well, in that case, the total user benefits are the sum of that gray triangle and that green square. That green well, rectangle, rather, uh, is the revenue. And that's what a private business would care about. But social cost-benefit analysis cares about this entire area. So in fact, while at first it seemed that this rail system is inefficient, 
if this is a good estimate of demand, it turns out to, be, have, to have positive net benefits. The area of that triangle, as you can confirm, is uh, 4.5 million. And the revenue is 1 million. So the total area is 5.5 million. The costs were $1 million operating costs. And total capital costs were 10 million. But if the interest rate is 10%, that means they're making a $1 million of interest payments per year. Or in other words, operating plus capital costs are $2 million compared to benefits of 5.5 million. So this is a positive uh, net benefit project. OK, you might say, Matt, just because some users are willing to pay $10 for a ticket doesn't mean that we have a demand curve like the one you drew. And I would say, you're right. So let's use a different approach. Uh, this is the approach that I'm going to take in what follows, and also a common approach used in transportation planning, transportation economics. And that is to find estimates of the price elasticity of demand. You all study uh, principles of microeconomics, right? And so you've heard of this concept of elasticity. Well, this is one example of how elasticity is used in analysis. And uh, previous studies have been carried out and estimated elasticities for goods from transportation to beer to heroin. And so you can look in these published studies and find estimates of price elasticity of demand. A common price elasticity of demand estimate for transit is negative 0.3. And I'm going to skip most of the details of how one takes an elasticity estimate, because I don't want to put you to sleep. But for those of you who might be curious, this slide shows the calculations. Basically, you have an elasticity estimate. You know the price. You know the quantity. With those three pieces of information, you can derive the demand curve that's shown at the bottom right. And uh, plotting that demand curve, you find a smaller area uh, of consumer surplus. You've all studied uh, consumer surplus, so you know that that triangle, this gray triangle, is the consumer surplus. And so now if we add that triangle to the uh, rectangle, we find that total benefits are um, 1 million of revenue plus uh, uh, two-thirds of a million of consumer surplus. So anyway, less than $2 million. But costs, annual costs, were $2 million. So is this light rail system inefficient? Not necessarily, because what have we excluded? All the non-user benefits, right? People may be taking this train, and that's freeing up road space for faster travel times, fewer accidents, less pollution. OK, so we haven't taken into account those external benefits. Estimating those is complicated. But what this analysis would tell us is that these external benefits have to be at least $333,000 for this project to be efficient. OK, so that's uh, the background of the approach. Uh, it's important to emphasize that just because the, negative, the numbers might be negative, this is a simple cost-benefit analysis. And we have to take into account all benefits before we can conclude that the system as a whole is efficient. Well, I'm not sure to what extent you can see these numbers, but this uh, table presents the exact same type of cost-benefit analysis that I just walked you through as a hypothetical example for uh, virtually all of the rail systems in the United States. This includes light rail and heavy rail. And, and what's the difference? Well, I, I'll, I'll explain it with an example. Heavy, BART is an example of heavy rail. There are sometimes 10 or more cars on a BART train that go very fast. And they usually have separated guide rails. Uh, light rail, on the other hand, has maybe two, maybe maximum four trains, doesn't go as fast, and runs on the street sometimes. And this includes both of them. One thing you might be able to see on the right-hand side is that virtually all of these systems have negative net present value, negative net benefits, except for two, New York City, which is the top one, uh, and, and BART. So one takeaway that you might take from this is that most of these systems are inefficient. I would again caution you that we haven't estimated the external benefits, so we can't necessarily conclude that. Uh, though, uh, one thing we definitely can say is that even ignoring external benefits, two systems are efficient. Um, as I said, even ignoring external benefits. So I promised to do a simple cost-benefit analysis of a BART, and, and there it is. The way that I did this is by taking data on trips, the fare, the operating costs, and the capital costs. With those four pieces of information, as well as the assumption that elasticity is negative 0.3, we get these numbers. 
doing the exact same uh, procedure that I walked you through in the hypothetical example. What about light rail? Well, this comes out to have a, a negative $115 million of uh, benefits annually, or in other words, $115 million of losses annually. Now, there is a congestion relief benefit, and proponents of light rail in San Jose usually highlight that as one of its main benefits. This number tells us what those benefits would have to be at a minimum for this system to be, to be uh, efficient. Well, as my uh, cost-benefit analysis students know, one component of every good cost-benefit analysis, simple or comprehensive, is a sensitivity analysis. And this means, let's look at how the results are sensitive to our assumptions. And so before the table I showed you, we assumed all elasticities were equal to negative 0.3. In the research that I took, uh, undertook over the last year, we developed a methodology of estimating a unique elasticity for each system. And doing that, you find one more system has positive net benefits ignoring all external effects. Um, you also might be able to find Santa Clara Valley system here. It's about a third from the bottom. And so what that suggests to me is that even though San Jose light rail is often uh, thought of as being one of the nation's worst, for example, that San Jose Mercury News quote I showed you uh, at the beginning of the talk uh, suggested as much, but in fact, although it's near the bot, it's in the bottom half, it's not necessarily uh, the worst system. Okay, so that wraps up the, the, uh, the, the BART and, and light rail cost-benefit analyses. Next, I'd like to move into high-speed rail. The, figure, uh, the picture you see here uh, is taken in, was taken in 1964 in Japan. Uh, Japan built the, the world's first high-speed rail train. And um, it started construction in 1959. And five years later, it was finished. And that's quite remarkable. Uh, because in California, uh, you might recall, in 2008, voters approved uh, Proposition 1A to build the high-speed rail line. And here we are six years later in 2014, and they still have not started construction. In fact, the only progress that has been made that is tangible progress is that some of the buildings in the route have been torn down to make way for the tracks, but no tracks have been laid yet. Well, Japan had no benefit of any uh, existing technology to work from, and they were able to build a line from Osaka to Tokyo in, in five years. And by the way, the distance between Tokyo and Osaka is a little bit less, it's about 300 miles, I think, uh, uh, whereas, uh, well, I may have my facts wrong, but let me just say it's roughly equivalent to the distance between San Francisco and Los Angeles. Certainly, people have been thinking about high-speed rail in California for a long time, but official planning hadn't, didn't start until the early 1990s. In 1994, the high-speed rail authority was uh, formed by the California legislature. And as I mentioned, in 2008, voters approved Proposition 1A, which was a $10 billion uh, bond uh, uh, that would fund the project. And if you were a careful voter and you read the voter information pamphlet, you would find that uh, the supporters claimed top speeds of 220 miles, travel time from San Francisco to LA in about two and a half hours, and that capital costs were estimated at about $45 billion. So one misconception that I find some people have about this project is the original costs were, were only $10 billion, but that was never true. Even, it, even at this time, the original costs were estimated at $45 billion. It was only uh, about you know, a quarter of that um, that, that California taxpayers would fund through bond sales, and the other revenue were, was pro, uh, planned to come from other sources like the federal government and as well some private investment. This map shows you the um, uh, the red, uh, sorry, the yellow line shows you the initial operating segment, and this, the portion from Merced to Fresno actually is the first portion that they'll start constructing, and I've been thinking they're going to start construction any day now for the last three years, uh, so I, I don't want to venture a guess as to when it actually might start construction. It has been tied up with a uh, number of lawsuits, mainly the, um, the plaintiffs in those cases charged that the High Speed Rail Authority is not 
producing a system that they promised voters. In other words, that it's illegal because they promised the voters one thing, but they're doing something else. That has been uh, the common charge that these uh, lawsuits are based on. It seems like most of those challenges have um, worked in favor of the High Speed Rail Authority. Uh, but again, I stopped guessing when construction might begin. The next segment to be constructed, well, from Fresno to Bakersfield, which is roughly similar terrain, but the big challenge is going to be from Bakersfield to Palmdale. And uh, you might see this here in the, the bottom right portion of that yellow line. And the reason that's a big challenge is because it has to cross the Tehachapi Mountains. Um, so once that portion is built, in fact, there will be a working rail connection between San Francisco and Los Angeles, um, although it will partly run on existing, for example, Caltrain tracks down the peninsula, uh, and there are existing tracks um, from, for example, San Jose to Stockton, or, or um, from Oakland to Sacramento, and the idea is that even before the whole entire system is built, because some of these lines that you see here aren't, can, haven't been built yet, uh, the system will be operable. The train will uh, begin on conventional rail tracks until it gets to Merced, and then express to Palmdale, and then hop on the existing rail tracks in Palmdale and can go to Los Angeles. This uh, image is an artist's rendition of what downtown San Jose train station might look like. Uh, which assumes we don't get the, the A's ballpark. Well, it's a little bit trickier to do a, a prospective cost-benefit analysis. That means a cost-benefit analysis for a project that hasn't been built yet. But essentially, the technique is the same. The only challenge is we have to estimate uh, what will be uh, the benefits. Or in other words, we have to estimate ridership, and as well as estimate, co estimate co uh, costs. So, Every two years, the High Speed Rail Authority is required to publish an updated business plan uh, about how they plan to achieve their um, project and what their ridership estimates are. These figures show you revenue estimates produced by the High Speed Rail Authority. And so you might wonder whether we can really trust these, uh, given that their continued existence hinges on the project continuing to be uh, pursued. But um, I think that these, rep these numbers are uh, fairly trustworthy for a couple reasons. One is that they're subjected to peer review by academics, including some of the top transportation economists in the world, and their reputation hinges on uh, them making unbiased assessments of these sorts of things. And in addition, if they were found to be dramatically overstating revenues or costs, or understating costs, that could potentially put them in even more heat um, than if their numbers were not as high as um, uh, you know, they hope. So it's up to you to whether, whether you think these are reliable numbers, but I'm going to use uh, the estimate of $2 billion a year of revenue. And so this is, of course, uh, the product of trips and fares, and, uh, but the benefit of not looking at trips and fares separately is that we can just take this revenue figure um, and use it in our analysis. What about the costs? I'm going to make an assumption that's going to allow me to ignore the operating costs, um, but I do need to uh, calculate the capital costs. And um, you might recall that earlier the, the capital cost estimates were $45 billion. Well, the updated plan, they're higher at about $55 billion. And these include all of the uh, uh, stations and tracks and other uh, investments required. So this is a very simplified analysis. This is a complicated project to assess. First of all, it's going to be rolled out in stages. There's uncertainty surrounding the number of riders, what the costs will be. And so I'm making some, you might say, heroic assumptions. The point of this is so that you can understand where these numbers come from. It would be possible to do a better job, a more careful job, uh, but then it would be harder for you to follow. So, I'm going to assume that the project can be built in one year. Obviously, it's not going to be built in one year. And I'm also going to assume that the costs, capital costs are $60 billion. You saw the estimates on the previous slide were slightly less, but I'll increase those by about 10% uh, because costs tend to be higher than uh, estimates. And the revenue, as I mentioned, is $2 billion per year. The assumption that allows me to ignore operating costs is that they equal consumer surplus. 
This is a handy assumption because if I didn't make it, then I have to estimate demand and calculate consumer surplus. So uh, I don't know if consumer surplus is going to be more or less than operating costs, but for the purposes of simplicity, let's uh, say they're equal. Thus, this equation gives us the net present value. You have a $60 billion upfront cost, but then a $2 billion annual benefit. And this is discounted at a rate of 5%. What that means is, in the future, when benefits occur, they're going to be given less weight than if they occurred today. And that's a standard practice of cost-benefit analysis. Even with these assumptions, some of them, you might think, are uh, too generous to the high-speed rail program, you find that the net present value is negative $23.5 billion. But just as before, where we did a sensitivity analysis uh, about the assumptions that went into the uh, the analysis. Uh, I'll do a sensitive analysis for high-speed rail. And in particular, I want to look at three things. First of all, if we extend the time horizon from 50 years to 100 years, what happens? Well, the high-speed rail authority in their benefit-cost analysis assumed the time horizon was 50 years. But in fact, the project will last potentially much longer. I mean, if you look at uh, the city of San Francisco, you see streetcars still running on the streets that are over 100 years old. It's likely that this high-speed rail system will also last beyond 100 years. But it turns out the net present value doesn't change much. Even if we, this top number of 20.3 billion is virtually identical to the number I showed you before, negative 23.5 billion. And so why is it that even if we double the time horizon, the benefits, the net present value hardly changes? The answer is because of discounting. After 50 years, because we're discounting at 5%, a benefit that comes 50 years in the future, say $100 of benefits 50 years in the future, probably only adds about $3 in terms of present value. And so this heavy discounting means that an intergenerational project like high-speed rail is going to assign very little weight to future generations. And this is an important uh, consideration because uh, the rationale for discounting is that in our investment decisions, consumers and the government face opportunities, right? And we could invest in other things. Uh, but um, they don't take into account the preferences of the unborn. So to handle those, what are basically philosophical con uh, uh, concerns, I read the analysis with a discount rate of 2.5%. And what do we see? And that present value is positive 8.36 billion. Uh, finally, I looked at what happens if capital costs are 100 billion. At one time, these were uh, after the election, the capital cost estimates did rise almost basically to 100 billion dollars, and people were outraged because they promised us a system for 45 billion. So the authority went back to the drawing board and modified the uh, the system. And one of the things that they did was uh, decided to let the high-speed rail share tracks with Caltrain in the peninsula, and also in LA, uh, share tracks. So they're going to build fewer tracks. That means the cost is lower. Uh, but if costs rise again, then we see the, the, the project has negative net present value. So OK, these are back of the envelope calculations. I hope that you followed what into them. And I, uh, well, whatever they suggest to you could be different than what they suggest to me. But what they suggest to me is that if we evaluate high-speed rail under conventional assumptions, then it probably fails the cost-benefit analysis test. And probably this is why when some people look at this project, they see a crazy train. This is the phrase that the um, Republican gubernatorial candidate used to describe this project in the most recent uh, governor's election. But if we look at it from the lens of cost-benefit analysis, and that is, again, social cost-benefit analysis, and especially if we take into account that this is an intergenerational project that's going to benefit our children and grandchildren, and we don't discount our children and grandchildren as much as we do when we're talking about uh, uh, a shorter time horizon, then I think that this project might actually be efficient even if we ignore all external benefits. Okay, but what about external benefits? Ignoring those till now has been a limitation of my analysis. But there are uh, important external effects, for example, pollution. Uh, I mentioned fat uh, fatality reductions, also less congestion on the roads. And there are also potentially what you might call general equilibrium effects, meaning 
land use patterns could change as a result of, in fact, all of these rail systems. Now, ideally, we can measure these impacts, quantify them, and then monetize them. But again, that's a challenge to do. So instead, let me just paint the picture of what these types of impacts might look like, and you can decide for yourself whether you think they're large enough to justify these projects. Because after all, some of these projects uh, may have negative net benefits if we don't include external impacts. I mentioned earlier transportation accounts for 30% of the, of the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, in 2006, Governor Schwarzenegger signed uh, an important piece of uh, important regulation into law. This is the Global Warming Solutions Act. It's also known by its legislative name, AB 32. And I'm not sure how many of you have heard of this, but it is the most aggressive climate change regulation in the country. In other words, no state nor the federal government has as aggressive of uh, uh, climate regulations as we do in California. It requires California to reduce its carbon emissions from uh, from um, to 1990 levels by 2020. And one of the biggest tools in California's toolbox is the cap and trade system. And this cap and trade system, you may have heard about how a cap and trade system works in your uh, principles of microeconomics classes. Basically, it requires people or firms who emit carbon dioxide to purchase a permit to emit carbon dioxide. And if they don't have the permit, they can't emit it. So they'll have to buy permits, either from the government or from other firms who haven't used all their permits. Basically, it's a way of taxing firms for their emissions, but it has the benefit that it encourages firms to innovate, to lower their uh, emissions so that they can sell their permits to other firms. And so it has some desirable properties, but the main goal is to limit carbon dioxide emissions. By the way, this is related to high-speed rail, not only because high-speed rail might contribute to lower emissions, but also because some of the revenue raised through this cap-and-trade program will be used to fund high-speed rail. It's also possible that high-speed rail will change the way our cities look. Perhaps in San Jose, the best example of this is that Levi Stadium was built, probably not coincidentally, next to both a, high, uh, a light rail line as well as the commuter rail lines that go to Oakland and Sacramento. When light rail was conceived, San Jose was a, an agricultural area. In fact, across the street from the VTA headquarters was onion fields. Uh, but now, uh, along North First Street, we're starting to see more and more uh, developments. You might be wondering, why is denser development a, a good thing? Why am I making it sound perhaps like that's a good thing? Well, in and of itself, it's not. But one of the consequences of cities developing more densely is that people drive less in denser cities. And this figure shows the relationship between density on the x-axis, this is number of people per square mile, living in the city, uh, the central city of the metropolitan area. And on the y-axis, we see daily vehicle miles traveled. VMT stands for vehicle miles traveled. And so cities like New York and San Francisco are dense and have little driving in them. But cities like Raleigh, North Carolina, and Oklahoma City are not dense and have a lot of driving. So it's possible that these land use impacts, while in and of themselves not valuable, could lead to further reductions in emissions and this is one of those benefits that proponents of the uh, rails programs highlight. Now, it's very difficult to estimate the impact of rail systems on land use because how do we know what would have happened if San Jose, for example, didn't build a light rail system? No. We can't do that experiment where we go back in time and take away the light rail system and see what would have happened. So no one actually can estimate uh, precisely the impact. But some of you who have been, um, who have lived in San Jose your whole lives uh, may have some sense of this. Well, if you haven't lived here your whole lives or you were born before 1975, then these photos will give you a picture of what San Jose looked like in 1975. This is Santa Clara Street. You can still see the De Anza Hotel in both pictures, but on the picture on the right, which is taken recently, you see a uh, 
uh, quite a few uh, high-rise development, uh, high-rise buildings. This is a picture of um, Cesar Chavez Park in downtown San Jose. On the right, you see the Fairmont Hotel uh, rising from what previously, on the left, you can see was a parking lot. This is a picture of First Street and the new light rail line that replaced, uh, well, after several decades, the streetcars that used to run along the same route. But in the 1970s, uh, uh, there was also a parking lot where the Fairmont Hotel sits today. Well, this one is mainly for the interest of San Jose State students. Uh, before the Martin Luther King Library existed at the corner of 4th and San Fernando, uh, we had another building there. And I think it was a science building. And I've got a, few, a couple more pictures uh, of uh, campus. Uh, here you see the Paseo de San Antonio and uh, today, on both sides of that, there are uh, condo buildings and apartment buildings. But in the 1970s, uh, there, it was a parking lot. And my final picture is San Carlos Street. Today, you walked uh, down uh, through campus, and you um, may enjoy a grassy campus. Uh, but in the 70s, there was a street running through San Carlos. And it was uh, only, I think, at the beginning of the 1980s when, when uh, this street was, uh, the, the pavement was torn up and, and grass was planted. And I, um, I gave a similar version of this talk earlier today, and the, um, the hostess at the restaurant where I spoke while I was going through my slides mentioned to me that she was a San Jose State student in the 80s and that it didn't feel like a real university then. And only after they, uh, they created this green space did it feel like a real campus. So in the advertisement to this talk, I promised that I would give a provocative lecture, as the title of this talk uh, promises. Um, and I want to uh, highlight some challenges to both rail opponents and also rail proponents. First, starting with the rail opponents. It's true that high-speed rail may not pass the cost-benefit test under conventional assumptions, but I think it's important to keep in mind, at least from a philosophical perspective, that this is a project that's going to benefit future generations. And if we use standard conventional assumptions regarding the discount rate, we're not going to give those future generations much weight. If we do, then the project looks much better. And if we add in external effects, especially the effects of climate change, then in fact the project might look uh, much more efficient. I didn't assess the BART extension into San Jose uh, as such, but rather the whole BART system. And we found that it was one of the most efficient systems in the country. So maybe this is a, a heroic leap, but I think it's fair to say that uh, connecting to one of the most efficient systems in the country may not be a bad idea. Finally, light rail. I think this is, of the three projects, probably the, uh, the most difficult case because certainly ridership is low. San Jose is projected to grow, and at the same time, the VTA is planning on finding ways of speeding up the system. So I think in the future, ridership will, will grow. Um, but probably on the basis of user benefits alone, the system wouldn't be efficient. And it's, it would require measuring these external benefits or these general equilibrium effects, for example, on land use that I mentioned before. And so, uh, it's up, you know, you have your own decisions to make about whether you think this was a wise decision, but when I look at San Jose in the 70s and how it looks today, I think San Jose has come a long way, and it seems to me that light rail probably had something to do with that, and going forward, it might help San Jose to become uh, more of a city rather than a collection of parking lots. It's also true that there are some important changes going on in our society. And uh, these are very recent changes. And so when I first started hearing about them, I thought these are probably anomalies. But this figure shows, you know what VMT means now, vehicle miles traveled. Um, the, the, the 
x-axis shows the year, and uh, starting at 1990, going to 2014. So this is the most recent data. For every year, from 1990 to 2008, total vehicle miles traveled in the U.S. has been going up. But in 2008, it fell, probably due to, to the recession, right? It fell. But what happened? Even through the recovery, it remained flat. Meanwhile, population is growing. So it seems from this data that the U.S. has gone from uh, a country that kept driving more and more and more to a country that reached the peak. And even as population grows, vehicle miles traveled remains flat. Therefore, of course, VMT per capita, this is how many, how many miles the average person drives uh, per year, is falling. And it has been falling since, in fact, around 2005, before the recession started. So perhaps it's too early to claim that Americans' preferences for driving and transit use have changed dramatically, but I think this is a pretty compelling statistic. In addition to these travel statistics, we've also seen differences in the growth rates in metropolitan areas. The first uh, set of bars on the left-hand side shows the average annual growth rate from 2000 to 2010 for cities and their suburbs. And this purple line of uh, 1.38 shows that suburbs grew about three times faster than cities in the last decade. Now, we only have three years of data uh, of in the current decade, 2010 to 2011, 2012, and 2013. But for each of the first three years of this decade, what we've seen is that central cities have grown at a faster rate than suburbs. And this has not happened since the invention of the automobile. And so I think that this represents a major change, potentially a major change, in the, the way that Americans uh, choose where they live and also how they choose to move around. It seems that a lot of these uh, trends are being driven by your generation uh, and the preferences for young people to drive less, take transit more. So in these cases, the investments we've already made will look better than they do today. Well, what about rail opponents? I want to challenge them as well. First of all, I mentioned earlier, when the light rail system was conceived, the original plan was for it to form a ring around San Jose with spokes radiating, radiating from downtown to the edge of the ring. But I think that building it out today wouldn't be smart. It wouldn't be a good use of resources because it's expensive to build out, and at the moment, there isn't the population density to support uh, large riderships. Instead, what I think they should do is use what's called bus rapid transit, or BRT, to, uh, to begin to establish those links, to provide fast connections that would encourage development along those routes. And when development has reached a point that it justifi it's justified to develop their light rail line, then develop it. So uh, in short, I would say to them, we have to stop expanding the system for now and use buses instead. You also find some proponents of high-speed rail who think we should build it everywhere. And I think California is a unique place. California and then also the East Coast, for example, the Washington DC to Boston corridor makes maybe sense to have high-speed rail, but probably most other places it doesn't. And then finally, we might have to modify the route. Let me just give you some, a little bit of sense about what these points mean. So this is an example of uh, bus rapid transit from uh, in, in Cleveland, Ohio. And other cities in the country have developed this, but it essentially has many of the benefits of light rail. You know, it's fast because it has dedicated lanes. It is smoother, and so you can actually work on a laptop on these buses. And it has level boarding, which may not matter to many of you, but uh, for people in wheelchairs, it matters a lot. And in fact, for people who ride the bus, it also matters a lot because when people with, in, in wheelchairs get on, it slows it down. And so level boarding is a, a big benefit. This is a conceptual map I found on the internet that uh, I don't know who made it exactly. Well, I have the site, the link there, and you can find these, uh, all the references to the images I've shown uh, here. But um, this is uh, some high-speed rail proponents' vision of a nationwide high-speed rail system. And I think that this is, would not be a wise use of resources. Like I said, California and, and Boston to DC may make sense, but the rest of these links probably don't make sense. You know, we have air travel, which is 
maybe not the most comfortable form of travel, but certainly the fastest. And for long distance trips from Los Angeles to Chicago, even the high-speed rail train would take a long time. And then finally, there's a lot of controversy over whether we're going to build out the, the high-speed rail system as originally planned. This uh, highlighted area is uh, from San Jose to Gilroy, and then over the Pacheco Pass, basically into Merced. And this is the current plan, but I mentioned that if the capital costs run higher than currently estimated, the system is going to no longer be efficient. And I think it's important that we strive as whenever possible to uh, give the public efficient systems. And so we may have to rethink this route. We might have to use existing train lines, um, for example, uh, until it can be shown that these additional investments are, uh, are smart. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I... Um, I'm eager to hear your questions, and uh, if you would like to find more information about um, some of my research topics that I mentioned today, or some of my other writings that are less formal than research, I'd encourage you to visit my web pages or my blog. Uh, and thank you very much for your attention. Okay, well, I'm sure that if you haven't got a question at this point, I'm going to be shocked. <laughs> so it's just, I think there's a lot of territory to cover here. So uh, I, if you will just hold up your hand, I will come to you. And uh, I'll kind of keep ahead of everybody here. So here, be my guest. Oh, by the way, uh, if you, for one reason or another, have to leave, the uh, sign-up sheets will be back out. Hello, Professor, uh, Professor Hillian. Uh, you said that the uh, a high-speed rail system, like all over the United States, wouldn't be uh, efficient. But what about the proposal that we build a high-speed light rail that connects, um, like, that goes from San Francisco to Boston or something like that, like, that goes right over the original transcontinental railroad and put a high speed there? And I only ask that because um, I know. Uh, uh, is that uh, as that the only the third option, like one from California, one for um, Boston to Washington, and then one from um, San Francisco to uh, uh, or LA to uh, Boston, uh, well, San Francisco to Boston? Um, what do you think about that idea? And um, that that's about it. Well, uh, you know, I should say I haven't studied all of those routes in that map that I showed you. Um, in, in fact, I haven't formally studied any of them. But I, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what's behind my comment that most of these long distance routes are probably inefficient. Uh, recently, the Brookings Institution did a study about Amtrak and looked at their various routes. Amtrak has a system map that looks kind of similar, in fact, more extensive uh, than that map that I showed you before. They're not high speed trains. Uh, but nonetheless, what they found is that these long distance routes are the least efficient ones. And the only Amtrak routes that are either efficient or close to being efficient are short ones. And so it seems that it's inherent in the nature of trains that you know, they're, they're good when you need to get relatively sh medium to short distances. But if you need to go long distances, uh, they, they're just too slow. And um, you know, rail, uh, sorry, uh, planes are cheaper. and um, the, you know, the, the, the benefits just aren't there. Uh, thank you for the lecture, Dr. Hoyan. Um, so uh, you mentioned that uh, the, the rail lines will be using existing track to possibly do certain areas of it. Um, would that dampen the speed of the rail line so that it would no longer be a, a high-speed rail, which would might, you know, deter the benefits of it being a, a uh, a substitute over plane travel, or um, have you already thought of that in your benefit analysis? Well, y you are a sharp observer. Indeed, uh, if the system does not run over high-speed rail tracks for the entire portion, it'll be slower, and there'll be fewer benefits. Okay. Right? And I didn't adjust for that. I mean, there are so many f variables and factors that we could adjust for if we had more time, um, but uh, yeah, indeed, the benefits would be lower to that system. The cost would be lower, too. Um, but we'd have to redo the analysis under revised benefit estimates, and I don't have those. But it would be possible to say, you know, maybe if we know that speeds are going to be, say, 20% slower under a blended system, then perhaps we could just lower the benefits by 20% as a first approximation and, and uh, 
and that will give you a sense of how the cost-benefit calculus would come out. Hi, I would like to make a comment, um, and, and then there are a couple of points that I'd like you to, to um, give some input on it. First of all, I grew up with, uh, with this utopian uh, you know, public transit. I grew up in Bucharest in uh, Eastern Europe, so we have a subway, we have uh, you know, everything, light rail, buses, and I can tell you from personal experience, they're horrible. People absolutely hate it, okay? So my first observation, based on my own practice and what I've seen all, all over the world, is like people don't like it. It's not just California where we have very, you know, large areas, uh, but it's uh, anywhere in the world people love their cars and, you know, I would like people to also consider the, the alternative, the fact that we have electric cars, that we have solar technology. So there are other possibilities where we can uh, create much better human-centric transportation that is, uh, that is both efficient and, uh, and is not creating greenhouse emissions. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, that was one thing, but um, that was the comment. But I would like to say, look, if this is such a good idea, how come the greedy uh, capitalist, I'm one of them, um, how come they haven't built these things if there is, if there is any potential to, to, to have the, the proper ridership and, and make a dollar? Why haven't they done it? The other thing I would like you to comment on the fiscal. I'm, I'm sorry, I, have, I don't have a pen with okay. me. I'm starting to. The fiscal. To, uh, okay, okay. So I think I'm, I'm counting. I have so far three. If I could just take these three, that'd probably be the, my own my and, total and the bandwidth. Fiscal, the fiscal, the fact that we're probably facing a fiscal collapse, a very serious fiscal collapse in the United States with unknown consequences, social and economical consequences because of national debt and the unfunded liabilities. So all these, all these government projects, they're basically a gamble. You don't know how they're going to work, and, uh, and uh, as you said, no one knows the future, and no one knows what kind of technology will be 50 years down the road or 100 years down the mm -hmm. road. Maybe this thing is going to be obsolete in 20 years. Okay, let me, let yeah. me stop you there, because I think I'm not going to be able to address all your points just because I can't Thank remember you. all of your points. But um, starting from your first one, that people in Romania don't like taking public transit, uh, economists prefer to use revealed preference data rather than stated preference data. So you may have heard people say, I hate taking the subway, yet they're taking the subway. So, uh, and they're willing to pay for it, clearly. They pay something to do that. And so I don't see a problem with the methodology of using ridership and demand estimates to estimate the willingness to pay. Uh, I actually didn't say that the benefits are so clear that we should, you know, that, that they're so massive that there's no, even, there's no point to calculate these things. I said it's quite close, right? It depends crucially on the assumptions that we make, and especially with the philosophy, your own philosophy about uh, how appropriate is it to discount benefits of future generations. Uh, you bring up a good point with regard to the possibility of new technologies. Some of you have heard about Elon Musk's Hyperloop project. This is uh, uh, a, a concept that would basically put, you can envision it as a big pipeline from here to Los Angeles and inside would be a capsule, and we would sit in the capsule, and then they would pressurize it and basically shoot us down to LA, um, similar to those, uh, those technologies you see at the bank where you put your check in the bank and it shoots it up to the teller. And you know, people are laughing because we haven't seen this, and it seems like out of a sci-fi movie, you know, um, but it is an example of the type of technology that could emerge, and, and if that emerged, then who would take High-speed rail, no one. Uh, other technologies are uh, driverless cars. Um, and probably these are the two that people are talking about, at least that I hear. Uh, with respect to the Hyperloop, I would say this is a concept. It's totally untested. And if you look at the, 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 the time that it takes to build projects in the United States. Now, I'm glad that we don't live in a totalitarian dictatorship where uh, the government can uh, decide tomorrow we're going to build a train system here. I'm glad that we live in a democracy. Uh, but at the same time, it slows down our projects a lot. In Japan, they built the high-speed rail system in six years. Here, in six years, we've, we've basically done nothing. And so if you think that we should wait to see how the Hyperloop turns out to start, start building, I think that pretty much dooms the project, you know, because we have to wait how many more decades? And so uh, I don't think it's probably... That to me, it's not a compelling argument. You know, the uh, driverless cars potentially, but there again, you have to think of the cost not only of the system, of you know, the roadway system that would allow for driverless cars, but you also have to buy the cars, 
right? And so a social cost-benefit analysis will take into account not only the public expenditures, but also the private expenditures. And so if every Californian has to buy a new car that maybe costs twenty or thirty thousand dollars, plus the system, uh, the, the 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 road system that would require, I think it would be probably far greater than high-speed rail. So these are good points, and they enter the cost-benefit analysis in the area of risk assessment. And the future is uncertain. We don't know what technologies will develop, and I think that's a valid point. But my sense is um, trains have been around for 200 years. There's not a clearly superior technological alternative. And so uh, I would put some weight on it, but maybe not uh, as much as you would. Yeah, Tom. So Matt, I think one of the problems that I notice with these agencies is you know, you're looking at it and saying, hey, I'm going to analyze it in some economic sense and see if it's efficient and stuff like that. But the agencies um, don't use efficiency as a guideline in most cases. They use equity in terms of we're collecting tax revenue and we have to spread it fairly. So every time I've gone to presentations by VTA and then the um, San Mateo one is, well, we have to spend the money equitably. And so projects that might have a high benefit cost ratio uh, don't get utilized because or there's no ranking. Everyone gets a fair share of the money. And I think it's, it's kind of like light rail. It was the political consideration of where to locate some of these stations uh, that, that made it become less efficient. And you know, I'm glad they're going to close some stations. There's probably a lot of them that should be shut down. Uh, but you know, I think that's the other problem. The same thing I think would apply to bike share when they said, where are we going to put the bike share? And, and cities and neighborhoods said, well, let's put one in our neighborhood. Well, most of the people in neighborhoods own bicycles. You know, you've got to put it where people that don't have a bicycle might want to use a bicycle. And so I think if those incent if we, I think part of the problem is we need to incentivize this, the agency to bear some responsibility for failure. And, and then we might get better outcomes from them and more efficient uh, allocation. And so that's more of a comment. But mm -hmm. I think that's, it's the institutions themselves that bear very little risk of being wrong uh, in this. And so they just kind of pander to political interests and equity interests and, and don't have efficiency as a strong goal, I think. But you can comment on it if you want. Yeah, no, I mean, I totally agree. I think there are huge inefficiencies in the political system. Um, and I mentioned some of them before, you know, that it takes an eternity for what in other countries are simple projects to be constructed. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I think that we can, in a society, uh, really increase uh, our well-being if we can find a way to improve the political system. And I don't know what that is, but it's a worthwhile question to, to focus on. Uh, Matt, I'm, I'm uh, just curious, where, where do you think this, this kind of course of research that you've gone through, what's the next step in it? Um, well, um, it would be useful to try to measure these land use impacts and other external benefits, I suppose. Uh, that would be the next step. Um, where do you think the next step should be? <laughs> Well, I, one of the things that you mentioned was the uh, was the modified bus system, and <clears throat> I haven't seen very much about that. Although there is some literature about it, has anybody done that kind of work on the bus system? Oh, uh, yeah. I'm glad you asked that. Um, there has been work, and in the United States, we we're starting to see more and more of these bus rapid transit systems. But in fact, the countries that have the most of them are in South America. And so I have um, a colleague or uh, you know, a sort of friend in the profession who is a professor in Colombia. And he has done a study of the bus rapid transit systems in Colombia. And basically, his results show that they got carried away with bus rapid transit. They built too many lines. And you know, the, the ridership wasn't there, and they were too expensive. Because in fact, they're not cheap. I mean, it's not just a bus. It also entails potentially dedicated lanes and you know state new stations and, and you know and so on uh, so it's certainly possible to get carried away with bus rapid transit as well thank you well, one of the things that <clears throat> is always bothered me with the rapid transit proposals is that they're generally slower than people driving cars. 
And with the time value of money for people, especially in Silicon Valley, we're generally highly paid people where the opportunity cost of our time is quite high. Systems that are slower are generally not going to be ridden, I think, very often. Do you have any comment or, or how does your analysis include the value of people's time and the difference in speed between different transportation alternatives? Uh, there are two approaches to this. Um, one of them is the approach I showed that Caltrans takes in their model. They estimate the, the time savings and then they monetize that. So you might think of it actually as the, the money value of time. But, um, uh, but the approach that I take, take is different. I just looked at, you know, the ridership and what they pay and then as assume the demand curve because we know that even though the fare is whatever it is for BART, you know, say $5, uh, some people are willing to pay more than that and the value that they place on the system is, is reflected in their willingness to pay. And so it doesn't specifically break out the value of time. Um, but I would say, I mean, you know, your observation is correct about many people. They're not going to take a, a system that's slower. But at the same time, many people do take BART. And so even if it is slower, they still choose to take it. And so, you know, I think there's a convenience factor for people. Uh, in fact, it could be faster for many people. If you're going to San Francisco or a densely populated area, it's hard to find parking and it makes more sense. So. Um, you know, in, in San Jose, of course, it's not as dense, uh, and that's why right now the ridership is low and it looks like an inefficient system. But over time, land use patterns in San Jose will continue to change, and I'm taking a very long-term horizon perspective here. And so uh, thinking about the future, and especially with some of those trends in um, loca residential location choice that we're seeing, uh, cities are growing, suburbs are, shrink are not growing as fast. Not necessarily shrinking, but at the same time, people are driving less. So I think that over time, uh, some of these systems will prove to be uh, beneficial, whereas they don't look like it today. Two quick uh, questions. One is, uh, for the $2 billion annual revenue from high-speed rail, do you know how that's built up in terms of uh, number of riders and uh, fare per rider? And then second, you mentioned that uh, San Francisco is an example of a highly dense city yet San Francisco Municipal Railroad, SF Muni, mm. seems to be one of the worst performing right. um, lines from a cost-benefit analysis, and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, uh, good points. Um, so start, start with the second one. With respect to San Francisco Muni, you might have noticed on that, the first table I showed with all the uh, systems and the cost-benefit analysis, that San Francisco Muni was towards the bottom. First of all, it was expensive, and even though it has many more times the riders as light rail was it was really expensive so uh i haven't assessed that uh, uh system beyond just the ridership but you might say that um you know it, if you if you thought that it might be more efficient than those numbers suggest I'm not saying that's what you might think but um it is connected with bus systems and also uh the bart system so it's it's sort of hard to separate out uh, those impacts. Also, there could be big external benefits, for example, congestion savings. You know, if those lines shut down, then everybody in San Francisco who currently takes that would switch to the bus. And then those would, which are probably already crowded would become even more crowded. So uh, I think, you know, you might think about the, the external benefits there. And then your first point, remind me again, what was the the, uh, the oh, the, yeah, how to spread out the yeah. fare. Uh, I, yeah, I, those numbers are available in the same business reports that I got the revenue uh, estimates from. Um, so I can only suggest that you look there. The only intelligent thing I can say about that is I have heard from the High Speed Rail Authority representatives that they plan to charge as the, f uh, the fare 80% uh, of the cost of a market rate plane ticket. And so that's... Um, interesting question about what fare to charge because on one level you know the taxpayers are paying a lot of money f to build this system you'd think that they can give us the best deal possible uh, at the same time they have to finance the operations and so you know this is a good question for economics majors to think about should we, should they try to maximize revenue should that be their objective or should they try to maximize social welfare which might mean giving cheaper tickets uh, I think the ideal solution would be different classes. So 
you can ride first class or second class or third class, but if you ride third class, you know, you have to sit on a bench or something like that. And that's a way of getting the most riders into the system uh, and, you know, maximizing the benefits there. So anyway, why is it 80% of a, of a plane ticket? I think this is probably a political calculation. They want to make it less than a plane ticket, um, but they also want to raise revenue. Dr. No. Um, you didn't make any mention of road pricing and uh, charging road users, motorists, trucks, coaches, buses, whatever, um, a fee for using roads. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me, until you're doing that, you're really operating in the dark. Um, I mean, people, I realize we as taxpayers pay for the road, right. but the road users don't pay for the roads. And until they have to do so, um, I can't really see how you can make very many meaningful um, comparisons. Well, uh, that's an excellent point. And uh, economists are generally in favor of road pricing. Uh, the public usually often doesn't like it. They, for this reason you mentioned, they feel that we're already paying taxes, why should we have to pay again? Uh, but to an economist, it's a beautiful thing because if it's congested, you raise the price, people get off the roads. Uh, if we had a system of optimal road uh, uh, pricing, then the congestion benefits the transit would be less. And that's a good point. So, in fact, one of the reasons that trans the, the benefits to transit are greater than they otherwise would be is because we have an inefficient road pricing system. But, um, you know, it, it's same with... Uh, uh, with all of these projects, we have to keep in mind that we're, we're operating in, in a second best world. And so, uh, you know, it's hard to, we can certainly hope for optimal road pricing, um, but it, whether we actually will have it is a, you know, it's hard to predict. Yes, Fred. Um, <clears throat> along that line, related to it, uh, what is your view of uh, marginal cost pricing for public transit? Because it seems to me one more person on a mass transit system has a marginal cost of zero in terms of the energy carrying that person forward. So when it's not congested, what is you view? And of course, uh, if you had, when it's not congested, marginal cost pricing would inf imply no fare, zero. Right. So what is your view of uh, whether it's more efficient or better for society if mass transit were priced with marginal costs? Well, uh, it is related in some ways to the question that Mark just asked uh, because, um, well, certainly if the trains are not congested and if the prices were lower, more people would use it and it would generate more benefits. But then there's a problem of financing the system. And so then how will we subsidize the operations? You can tax people, but there's a distortion associated with taxation and we have to take that distortion into account as well. And so I, I don't have a, a clear cut answer to that question. You know. My, my general instinct is I'm in favor of marginal cost pricing, but I think it's complicated, and we have to look at the alternatives. You know, w if, if we lower the fare, where, how are we going to finance the system? And if the way that we finance it causes a lot of distortions in the economy, then we might actually prefer a, uh, a, a, a more of a self-financing system. Uh, but it's, it's a great question, and actually that will, I would rather say that to Jack's question about what is the next stage of research. I think looking at some of these uh, pricing programs for even Amtrak and other things, optimal pricing programs is a really interesting area for future research. Thanks you for those questions. Do I have anyone else? Well, let's, uh, ah, I have one more. That we'll call this sit and uh, please be my, be my guest. Um, so currently students, I know San Jose State students, I'm not sure about community colleges or any other students, um, but they get a subsidized free fare on the light rail. So I was wondering um, what impact that might have in terms of efficiency, specifically revenue, if that would have an impact or if that's been studied at all. I don't know all the details of that program. Um, what I, my belief, and it could be wrong, is that it, uh, Students actually pay for that through their tuition, and so um, you know it's it's basically you, you know you, you already paid for it, and so then they let you use it as much as you want after that. But uh, uh, so they do raise revenue. It's my understanding, and again I stand to be corrected, but I think that they do raise revenue through that. Um, 
And because the, the trains are generally uncongested, I mean, it's not always true. As, as people who ride light rail regularly uh, will attest, some of these trains actually are congested. And it was f sort of funny, when I was doing research, putting these slides together, I read some letters to the editor. And the first letter said, these trains ride around with nobody on them. We should just get rid of the whole system. And the second letter says, there's too many seat hogs. And they won't give up their seats to people. <laughs> and they're taking up two seats. So, uh, but to the extent that these trains are not congested, I think it's great. It's a good example of what Fred was just mentioning about marginal cost pricing. You, know, you can top on it and, and ride it. And, uh, and that encourages more students to use it than otherwise would. Okay, well, we hope that uh, if you have more questions, you'll join us over at Flames. Uh, we'll be there for a little while, I'm pretty sure. And uh, I want to thank you all for coming tonight. Let's have a nice round of uh, applause for Matt again. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, just watch our website, and we will post up our uh, lectures for next semester as soon as we have them confirmed. Thank you all.